Hello and good morning. Um, thank you so much for coming uh, uh, to come and uh, hear us have a quick chat because we are going to have a chat. Uh, and thank you for anyone who's um, tuning in on Facebook, tuning in on Neon. And um, it's amazing to be here on International Women's Day. It's amazing to be balancing for better because that's absolutely critical. Um, and we are going to talk about that a bit, but we're very, very lucky to have uh, a quite remarkable human being here this morning. Uh, and you are quite a remarkable human being. And, and that's a really important thing. I do count Nicola as a friend. We've done, we've done a few of these chats before. We've been on panels. We've been on quite big panels. We talked about this sort of stuff. But I've never had her just to myself. <laughs> <laughs> right, oh, so my goodness. Is, exactly. <laughs> So, uh, so all the you know any any notes or anything like that, they're they're completely out the window. But th th other than being, uh, you know, a human being, you are uh, you know Nicola is a very influential uh, businesswoman. She's very influential in the community, and she works for a company that is globally very influential. And I think you know today is really important, and there are a lot of important issues, a lot of things that Facebook are doing, a lot of things that we're doing. But the real understanding of uh, of some of the issues that, that women face in creating a fairer and more balanced and gender balanced world uh, are stories and, and that's what I really want to dig into. And um, behind all the awards, behind the glamour, you are a, bit, you're a northern lass really, aren't you? <laughs> right? And uh, how, uh, you know, one of the things that you always bring to things is passion. Right? Was that burning passion there when you started? How, how did you start? And you know, what were the barriers you faced starting a career? Okay. Um, so first off, um, I am so happy to be here. When I was asked, I was like, yes. Uh, not just because you're neighbours and we're literally around the corner, but chance to play with Nigel is always fun. So I've no idea where this will go, but uh, we'll, we'll give it our best. So first off, also, thank you for asking me. And also thank you for our partnership, which is just extraordinary. And we've done some incredible things together over the years. And please, God, we'll carry on and do more. But yeah, I'm a proper northern lass, um, born in Manchester. And I, I guess I was always a passionate person because uh, all my school reports said Nicola's rather over-enthusiastic. Uh, Nicola's always got a hand up. Nicola can be quite destructive. Sometimes she can be a bit silly. So there was all that energy. If some people in the room nodding, maybe you got similar um, school reports um, growing up. Uh, and it's pr particularly on my mind because I was at my younger son's um, uh, parents' evening last night, and there was definitely some similarities. So, uh, grew up in Manchester, did did not know anything about the advertising, media, creative world. It just, that's not what you had in the north of England. I didn't see it, didn't know anyone um, in the industry. And so went to university doing English and theatre studies. So I was on the, kind of was on a journey. And then I had a friend who was a year older than me that got a job at JWT in the media department when everything was together back then, because I am that old. And um, I just thought it sounded like the best job in the universe. I couldn't believe you could get paid to do that. And he did spend most of his time at lunch in those days. Yes. So uh, that, is, that is like, I'm going to go for that job. So that, that is how I started. It was wonderful back then. Oh, no. <laughs> it's still wonderful in different ways. Yeah. <laughs> But so, so, you, so you, you land at JWT? No, I actually Ordinary. started, no, he went there. I, I fancied BBH because of Nick Kamen, if anybody remembers the ad for Levi's, with Nick Kamen taking his um, jeans off in the laundrette. That is literally the ad that made me think, that's the industry I want to go into. <laughs> and so you, so, you, so you landed there. Yeah. Right, what, 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 what challenges did you, did you find in terms of how you thought about career progression? I think what opportunities. Yeah, so if I'm honest, I really didn't think about career progression because I didn't have anybody, um, and which sounds very naive, but I think I was, with hindsight, I look back and I think I was very naive. Um, I was ill prepared for all my first two years, three years of. Uh, reviews, pay rises, you know, I would get given like £400 and, and I would just go, thank you, that's brilliant. Um, I had no idea of my own worth, my own value. You know, people would say, one day I dream of having my own agency. It's not what I dreamed of. I actually, I actually dreamed of having a family. That was the thing that mattered to me. It was my North Star and I really, really, you know, I, I, I was married pretty young, but that was the thing that motivated me. And the career thing was, if I'm having fun and I'm doing a good job and making cool work, how lucky I am to be able to do both of those things. So I had different guiding things at different times. Yeah. That, that's a really interesting point, 
about the, the, the going by. So we were, uh, uh, we were in Davos together. One panel I w went to, which was on female leadership, and it's terrible of me, I can't remember her name, just like that. But she's the finance minister of Canada. And she said every single day, first, she is a mother. And her family comes first. And second, she happens to be the finance minister of Canada. And, and that's, cool that's to a say that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, only the finance minister of a country can just drop that. Yeah. <laughs> but, but, but that's good. But that is, that's the whole thing, because you're actually, you, you built a family, and quite a, quite, quite a big family. No, so I've got, we've got John and I, four kids, and um, with Danny's with, where are you, Danny? My son, uh, my son, age 20, uh, is here back from university in the States. I'm like, so I just want all the time I can get with him. And one of my proudest moments was a few years ago when Danny turned around to me and went, Mum, I am a feminist. And I was just like, oh. <laughs> my work on this planet is done. <laughs> so he's leading um, the, the male contingent feminist in our family. But yeah, four children, a daughter, uh, Gabby, who's 21 now working, uh, and three boys. Yeah. And so when, when did you actually become conscious then that there's such a thing called a career? And, and actually, that as you build a career, that you can have a bigger impact? I think it was um, the first time a headhunter approached me, and I had been in the industry about four or five years, so I was kind of coming up to being an account director, which mattered to me. It's not like the career thing didn't matter to me. I wanted to do a good job, and I wanted to be recognized, uh, but I, um, I didn't know my worth, and I remember that suddenly from nowhere, I was going for an interview, funnily enough, at JWT, so there I was. And, and literally in the interview, the person offered me a job. I was like, oh my God, is, is that how it happens? And is that what's supposed to be? And I came back and I thought, oh my goodness, I, I, don't, I haven't properly thought through what it means to be doing here, what, what matters to me, what my values are. And so I started to evaluate that about why would I move to JWT when I think I'm really happy at BBH. Yep. So I, I'll set out that, and I literally wrote out what were the things I was looking for and not looking for. And that was probably my first proper career conversation. So it was really an intervention from outside that started to make me wake up and think, oh, how could I do this differently? I, I think that's one of the things that people, uh, people are sort of forced into thinking, I must plan, but serendipity is one of the, one of the things in life that, you, that I think is most important to embrace. I agree, but I also think you can work bloody hard to be very lucky. Completely. Yeah, Completely. I really believe. And suddenly, so that was so lucky that someone called. Actually, it wasn't, wasn't because yeah. you had been doing a good job, you'd made good networks with people, and then the luck came. Yeah. And then, so having written that down, what, what then, what, what changed about the way that you thought about things? Yeah, so I think then what I did was the fact that what, what gives me energy, what gives me passion, what am I proud of? And actually it was that time that I changed my role at BBH. So I actually realized the thing I loved the most was the new business pitching. I absolutely love the thriller, like everybody's like, oh, we all love a new business pitch. And that thrill, that adrenaline, but also the learning. Learning has been a constant for me because the thing that was great about the new business pitches in BBH in those days is that you got to work with, with John, John and Nigel, Bartle, Bogle and Hegarty. And I just learned so much, so that's what I wanted to do. So I, I started to talk to the guys about it. And they said, well, why don't you do both? Why don't you be your account director on one account and do new business for the other bit? And we'll train you up and be one day you'll be the new business director, maybe. So that's, that's when I made that change because of that intervention. What, what do you think is special about pitching for new business? Because you say everyone loves it, and, and I love it. What do you think is special? What's the, what's the, the learning? Uh, well, there's a few things. First of all, there's a f you, well, it used to be a very finite period. So it used to be four to six weeks where you'd suddenly have to go, here's a whole new industry you know nothing about. You've got to become an expert in the industry. You've got to know these people really well. You've got to come up with an idea in a really concentrated time period, which in those days used to take us six months to a year to come up with a 30-second TV ad. <laughs> yeah. So you've got to do that in a six-week period and then put on a show in a creative way that will inspire that people to believe, here's my money, let's go and let's play. But for me, it was about seeing how the senior people were interacting, working under pressure, their relationships, and that learning that I was taking from them as well yeah. was a massive motivator. That's what, why I like it. When, so you said an interesting word there, which is senior. When did you, did you ever think suddenly, oh my God, I'm quite senior then? <laughs> It came to me through somebody else, actually. Again, it was Stevie Spring, actually. When I changed jobs from moving from BBH to Grey, I, I went and asked her for her advice and didn't know her. And I said to her, look, I don't know you. Would you, could, would you give me an hour of your time so I could pick your brains? 
And she said, well, what you have to understand, Nicola, now, you know, what, now that you're in senior management, I remember going, oh, God, <laughs> why would look at check me out? Um, and, and she gave me great advice to say that people will be looking at every single thing that you do. They'll be looking at the way you speak. They'll be looking at your body language. They'll be looking at your notes and your doodles or whatever and how you show up. Think about everything. Because if you're having a bad day, how you transmit that energy out to 200 people will be very strong. It was such good advice. And so that was probably, it was her. It was her that done it. <laughs> And, 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 and again, that is a, a really important thing, isn't it? Actually being quite brave to reach out to somebody you don't know and actually ask for that hour and actually ask for that advice. Well, I, I don't thing, think, think it's... I, I suppose you could look at it and say it's brave. What's the, what's the great power that she has? The great power is that she'll say no. Is that so terrible? I yeah. mean, is that really going to impact? Probably not. I mean, I was so grateful to get the hour with her. You know, that was a blessing. But I often think people are paralyzed into fear, especially about themselves and their own careers, because they don't actually think about what's the worst that can happen. They dread this thing that could be, rather than reality of what it is. People are people. Sure, but, but yes, but, but let's, uh, a, a reality is people do have that barrier. And I, I, I see it all the time with people, oh, I can't, you know, they're going to be too busy, which is really sometimes an excuse not to to actually reach out, isn't it? It's totally an excuse. On the way here, I was actually doing some mentoring um, with a, an amazing woman. And I said to her, you've just not made the time to, it was about her career. I said, you've not made the time to think about yourself. All I've listened to is excuses why you're not doing, you're not, and we're all so busy, we can all fill the time in. But I realized, because I made this mistake, was that I, I didn't make the time to think about my career. I absolutely didn't in those early years. Yep. I didn't, so I took it for granted. And if you take it for granted, you get the career that comes along rather than the one that you actually want and will be useful to yep. you. I, just, I, I'm, I love a, a definite, I always think about fear. And I always think about fear is, you, and there's a lot of fear around at the moment, you take an unknown and you extrapolate the worst possible outcome, right? and that drives fear. And actually, that, you know, and you've just got to think, just embrace it and embrace life. And your career is part of life, isn't it? Oh, my goodness. Uh, yes. And I definitely also tell my kids, don't go through life thinking you should have, could have or would have done something. Right. And like even to silly things like going and get a picture with a, a person that you're inspired by. Like, oh, they'll say no if they don't want it. But if they do want it and you've got that <laughs> picture, looks great on Facebook and what's, Instagram. <laughs> what's, what's your favorite picture? From you. <laughs> But um, no, seriously, what's the one you what's the, what was the one where you really didn't think I'm going to get that? Oh, Oprah Winfrey, because yeah. I, I mean, she, I got a bit of a girl crush, so that yeah. was a pretty. Cool <laughs> that was brilliant. So at the same time, you're you're building this career, you're building a family, and still you've got some time for your passions in a wider community. Can you talk about that? And just in terms of both in terms of women both in terms of some of the other things that are important to you. Yeah. So um, I grew up in a religious um, Jewish family, and Judaism is a really important part of um, our lives. And at the heart of Judaism is about giving back. So I always saw my parents doing that. My husband has always done that. So it, it wasn't even a conscious thing. It's just that's what you do. Um, so the whole way along, I've always been involved in different charities, um, different communal activities, different industry um, activities, because I think it's the right thing to do. And I think if you're in a privileged position like I am and always have been, I was born with privilege. It's not about money. It's about the education I have. It's about the fact that I grew up in a stable family, that I had unconditional love, um, that I did get a good job. So all these things were my privilege. And therefore, why wouldn't I do things? So yeah, I've been involved, and I will always be involved in, in, in different activities that are outside of my day job. And so, so you, you're doing all that, and then suddenly you get a phone call, and it's from Facebook. So what were, the, what were the things that went through your mind as you got that call and the decision to go to, to a company that sits in the heart of the digital economy and obviously you know, is very, very influential in, in our lives? So I left Gray and then went to Kamarama. So yep. built Kamarama up from 12 people to 250 people. And I knew all of them. I'd, we'd hired, between the four of us, every single one of those people. And then Carolyn Everson, who's a dear friend of both of ours, called me one day and said, um, oh, I'm in London, love breakfast. Would you like to get together? And I said, yeah, that'd be great, because she's cool and I knew who she was. 
So we go for breakfast, we're in the Ivy, and literally the Ivy six years ago, you knew everybody in the Ivy. And because she's American and passionate, she literally goes, hi, right, we've got our drinks. And she goes, but I'm not here just to have a catch up. She said, I'm here to see if you want to be the head of a mirror for Facebook. And I literally spat my drink out. <laughs> I was like, Jesus, I wasn't expecting. And I could see that I knew everybody. And I was like, oh, that's really interesting. Yeah. Let's talk quietly. <laughs> you know, <so. laughs> And uh, Carolyn is not quiet. No, she's not. She's like, woo, you know, this is Carolyn. So um, I said, I've got my own business. You know, this is a bit, I know all 250 people. I said, well, I'm not sure. I don't think, oh, not really. It's such a woman thing to do, isn't it? I don't think I could do it. I'm not sure. She says, well, take an overnight on it. Have a think about it. And I went home. I remember talking to John. He went, are you mad? <laughs> have the conversation. Have a think. You don't know what it is. Go and see it and explore it. You love digital. You're passionate about it. I'd been the head of, uh, I was just coming to the end of my term at the IPA as president of the IPA. My whole mantra had been about creating digital pioneers. So that's kind of where it happened. Yeah. But, but leaving a company that you've helped create, is it, again, it's almost like leaving a child. And, and, and again, you went and had the conversation, but and, and it is about digital power. But, but also you had to realize that you then go into a different level of exposure Right, just in terms of I don't you know, think the I, profile of I, don't, I don't think I realised that. I really don't think I realised that. And I think certainly Facebook six years ago to where Facebook is today is a very different company. So yes. even if I take the UK, when I joined, yeah. we were less than 200 people, and, and now we're 2,500 people. Yeah. So the scale is very different. I mean, the values are the same in the core, but you know, the realisation within society about some of the challenges that you know, digital disruption, of course, that's very different now yeah. to where it was. Yeah. So in 2015, um, again, you've got another call, you get, and uh, suddenly you're being made a CBE. How did that feel? Honestly, I thought it was a joke. <laughs> <laughs> you get a letter. Or you get this letter just comes randomly in the post. You're not expecting it. You see it. And I remember opening it and just like, bloody, going, bloody hell, bloody hell. <laughs> Is this yeah. real? Um, and then sort of made, and you're not allowed to tell anyone either. It's like a whole secret thing that goes yeah. on. Uh, till the list is announced, because you have to agree that you want to do it. Uh, like, who's going to say, well, do people do say no? They have yeah, little please. protests. Yeah. Not me, not me. I was <laughs> like, oh, my God. I was already thinking through what my outfit was going to look like, <laughs> who I oh, was going to invite. Well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was just felt amazing. They, um, they gave it me for uh, services to the creative industries. Uh, I worked for seven years running the government's creative industries council, so I, I was really, really humbled by it. It was amazing. Yeah. And we had a great day. Yeah. We make parties for any and every excuse. My parents are uh, party planners, kosher caterers. So the other thing they all instill, <laughs> it's good for business, but it, they instilled in us, just sell it. life is so short, so precious, make, make parties celebrate. Yep. So you built a career, you built an agency, you're running this huge business. I mean, actually, management today, 2005, right? Nicola was seen as a, a, global, industry, uh, a global industry leader of the future. Weren't you? And, and I mean, that's that's quite amazing. Um, that's and then I was under thirty. At under the time. thirty, I know. <laughs> it's quite. But depressing. that's good. Yeah. Then you got a different phone call, didn't you? Which was a diagnosis, you know, and you were diagnosed with cancer a couple of years ago. Can you talk to us about that? Yeah. So th this was just very um, unexpected. Um, it was November 16, and I found a tiny lump, like this big, in my groin. And di I wasn't ill, didn't feel ill, nothing. And uh, my GP is a friend, and I phoned her, and I said, I've got a lump in my groin, what do you think? She said, it's nothing, they come and go. If it's still there in a month, then give us a call, and I'll have a look. So I saw her a month later, I said, still here, she had a look. It was like one of those crazy busy weeks. Um, I'd just done a speech at the CBI that morning, that thick yeah. thing. Went to see her in the evening before flying the next morning. And she went, oh, I don't like the look of it. And I went, how much do you not like the look of it? She goes, I don't, I don't like it, but I don't know what it is. And then she said, I'll arrange for you to go on your travels. I'll come back Friday, and I'll arrange for you to see someone. And I uh, went to see someone, and it got diagnosed. It was like, he was like, oh, I think you're OK, but I'll just do a CT scan. And um, yeah, I, within five days, I was diagnosed that I had uh, follicular lymphoma. A, it's a cancer nobody's heard of, but it's actually quite common. And it's an incurable cancer. So I will have this for the rest of my life. Um, but it's a funny one in as much as you, you, can, um, 
you, you can, it, it, they said it's a bit like diabetes in that it can flare up and you'll need treatment and then it will um, go away. Ten years ago, the life expectancy for somebody with this was five years. Um, that, and of course, the worst thing to do is then re go on Google, which of course you do. <laughs> and <laughs> it's just disastrous. Dr. Google's not helpful. Um, uh, but there has been a lot of progress uh, in the last 10 years, not, a, not enough. But it um, you know, was a massive shock. I, I didn't have treatment for a year because there's no benefit to treating early. Not like, you know, normally you hear the word cancer and it's like, got to fight it, got to beat it. It's not, it's not like that with this no. one. Um, this one is, it's like a strategy as to how, when you treat, how you treat. Um, and so I finished in, I did treat last year and had chemo last year. Yeah. And, and you know, and that's an, that's a whole different set of, uh, of, of challenges. And if you like, I wouldn't call them barriers, but, but you talked quite a lot all the way through uh, about the energy and talk about the passion. And you talk about, I mean, how, how, how do you inculcate that into what you do and how you do it? And, and because I think that, you know, it's a, just another thing that you have to balance. There's your health, the family, the work, the community, everything. Else. How, how, do you, how are you coping with that? So, actually, the first weekend was a pretty good indicator of where I went from because I literally cried all weekend. I had the worst weekend. I Googled everything. I, was, I lost half a stone just from worry in one weekend. I mean, that's how t severe the trauma, I guess, the shock. And I remember saying to John I, as, on the Sunday night, nobody knew at this point. It was Danny's 18th birthday a week later, and I didn't properly know what it was, but I knew it was not good because um, I could see tumours up and down. And I remember saying to him that on the Monday morning when we were going to see the doctor for more of the information, I said, I'm not doing this. This is not me. This is not my energy, my levels. This is how I do things. So I literally, I said, before we go, I, I'm just going to get my hair done. Um, yep. <laughs> so I went and got my hair done and I bought, um, I, I bought a tracksuit because I didn't have a tracksuit. And when you have scans, <laughs> when you have scans, you can't wear anything with metal or zips or this. And it was like, I actually haven't got anything. So I thought, you know, what? I'm going to go in there and feel good and I'm going to put my makeup on and I'm going to attack it like I do everything. Yep. Low energy is not me. And back to that spiral of what, pe you know, what brings people down. Like the more you think negative, yep. the fear, the more you go down. So actually, over the last two years, I've had two wobbly weekends. That was the first one. And then I had a second one, which was when I was told I was going to need chemo. That was hard. It was really hard because I'd really done everything I could that was in my power, back to the shoulda, coulda, woulda stuff, yep. eating healthily, exercising, working, all of these things. And that was like, I thought I'd have another six months before I needed chemo, and that was hard. So I, com I think I'm good at compartmentalizing. I think I've always been very good at living in the moment, feeling grateful for what I have. Um, and being very satisfied at any stage of my life, I've always felt very satisfied. Yeah, and and, and I think that positivity will will d drive you forward. And and cause we we spent quite a bit of time talking, quite so because it was you you were in Davos a few weeks later, weren't you? And you know again, and, and if you've ever been there, it 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 it's, it's quite a draining experience, isn't it? But you were there. So, yeah, so I was diagnosed fully in December, and then Davos is the end of January. And I'd like, I didn't know what was going to happen. So I thought, am I going to have treatment straight away? Didn't know. I suddenly had to become an expert in this cancer. Yeah. And I was like, well, screw that. If I, I wasn't ill, remember? I didn't have symptoms. I didn't feel ill. I had the same energy levels. And I'm like, right, well, then I'm going to work until I'm not able to. And, yeah. Yeah, and I it, hit those slopes once again. The, the, yeah, that's right. And, 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 and we chatted quite a lot because... Um, uh, one of the reasons that I'm so passionate about gender equality is um, my mother got cancer when I was nine and she died when I was 13 and I was the eldest, uh, just a two. My father being, because I, I know I don't look it, but I'm actually quite a bit older than Nicola as well. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, back then, you know, my father was reasonably useless, right, uh, about <laughs> that. And so in the end, you know, I, I, you know, you're trying to do school and you're trying to do sport and you're trying to actually iron and learn how to cook and cook and do all that sort of stuff. Uh, and so when I got to university, my, my free ninth I did in women in society because I really un tried, wanted to understand. Because how you try and balance those things and try and do all the other stuff is just incredibly difficult. And that's why I think, you know, again, you know, bringing it round, 
International Women's Day is critical because actually in the end, and, and I really do like you know, balance for better because this is quite an intractable issue. You know, gender inequality, you know, and the, the lack of understanding, and, you know, and, and we've, we've had greenwashing, we've got purpose washing, but there is also a lot of gender washing. Uh, you know, people saying, oh, you know, we, we're really supporting this. But, I mean, you came up with some, you know, some the government's pub published some stats this morning. I mean, why, why is it so important? What can we do more? I mean, my goodness, so much, um, so many things. So I, I wrote them down because Alison Rose, the deputy CEO of RBS, did a report today in the UK called the Rose Review. And I've seen similar numbers all over the world, but I think these numbers are frightening. And I think actually answer yeah. the reason why. So um, in the UK, only one in three, and forgive me for not knowing them, but it literally came out this morning, only one in three entrepreneurs are women and their businesses are typically much smaller. Which means from a gender gap perspective, we are missing 1.1 million businesses in the UK um, alone. How the UK compares with other countries is, is dismal. Only 6% um, of UK women are running a business compared to 15% in Canada, that's the world's highest, 11% in the US, 9% in, uh, in Australia and the Netherlands. Just take the UK, if you got the UK to the average of those countries, so move it up to three points, it would add 200 billion pounds to the economy. So if you, you know, if you multiply that around the world, and, the, and you know, the global growth numbers are not great at the moment. So that's one stat. The other stats are what we know is that, and what the research has been done time and time again, any organization that has diversity at the top just does financially better. On average, about 20% better. So you go, okay, it's good for business. It's the right thing to do because we want to bring up men and women and, to, and children to kind of look up and see role models above and around. But there's, there's, it's really a challenge. And... I'm really passionate now, not just about uh, man-woman diversity, I'm really, really interested in becoming more involved in the whole area of intersectionality to make sure that we do have people from different social, economic, um, race, religion, all different types of backgrounds. That's when you get the most interesting things. And it's certainly from an advertising industry perspective, if you look at the heydays, you know, it was when people from different backgrounds came together, made amazing things together. Yeah. That's when you get the creativity and the innovation. Yeah. I, I, and I think that's an incredibly good point because I think I, 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 our industry is an amazing industry. You know, it, it's called a creative industry for, for, for a reason. And it is, as you say, the melting pot. And we really need to keep embracing that. And, and, and diversity creates better decisions. It does create better balanced decisions and fairer decisions. Totally. And so who in the room, because I can only see the room, who here is responsible for hiring somebody? Who's ever hired somebody in the room? Hands up. Almost everybody in the room. Okay? Every time you make a decision, you're, you're changing and impacting your culture. When you, are getting your, when you are looking at your long lists of people coming in, do you have diversity? I mean, this is such basic stuff, but every single person has the power to make the change. Sometimes we don't think about the power that we have, but every single person has that power. So, um, uh, Annette Waring, who was running our Canadian business, right, literally did a really simple thing. Took the names off every CV. Right? So any CV that came in, took the names off. What happened? Right? Number of women went up. Actually, the number of uh, you know the racial diversity went up as well. It's really interesting. Yeah, I, just is that. I love that. that. Yeah, it's those small is things. That but the, bias. Oh yeah, I mean so much so. And to the men um, listening, and to the men in the room, my God, you're important. We need you to be our allies. We need you that when you see bad behaviour, of which there is still so much bad behaviour in terms of when people speak over each other, we need you to do that. But I also just have to give a shout out to one special person in the room, if I'm allowed, which is to Pippa, my pal, because sometimes it's also the big stuff that people do. So taking on positions of leadership outside, so you can direct people on the journey by being the president of WACL, that matters, and that's important too, because you inspire the next generation to do greater stuff. And sorry, Sabrina, we're going to overrun by 30 seconds, of course. Um, but you know, again, together... Facebook and Dan, we can, we can, we're doing some interesting things. And thank you for doing, you know, women at Dan and, and helping sponsor that with us. But again, what more can we do together? If we really, really, you know, we've got all the stuff that we're doing, female foundry, blah, blah, blah. what else can we do? Well, we shouldn't let our imaginations be limited because one of the things that I also want to share is that when we were in Davos last with Tim, with Nick, you, yeah. me, Cheryl, one of the main items that we talked about was this. It was about diversity, how we can use both of our companies coming together 
to make sure that we can be even bigger, even stronger in the work that we do. So we get the men and we get the women to come on the training programs, but we probably haven't even dreamt yet of the, all the things that we can do together. So that would be my ask. If you've got an idea, put your hand up, tell us, because we haven't got all the ideas. It's going to take all of us to do this, but we all can make a difference. That is the perfect way to end. Thank, thank you for being you, but thank you for being so open and, and so inspirational. Thank you. Thank you.